What I thought I'd talk about, I want to talk about this the whole thing about clefts. There's been a couple of recent papers on it as well, which I've no doubt you've seen. And I raised the contention, are, are, are they um, part of a congenitally malformed mitral valve? And I think obviously they are, but what are the implications of that? Um, I want to talk a bit about um, the saddle shape of the mitral valve because people go on about it and, and they don't really tell you what they mean by it and every talk's got about retain the saddle shape and there are rings designed to retain the saddle shape and I just want to show you what a load of nonsense all that is. A little word about SAM and how to avoid it. Um, calcium, we'll just flash, flash past that because there isn't much to say. And really the most important thing of all in all of this is outcomes. We are very bad at surgeons, as surgeons, and looking at true outcomes. Patient comes off the operating table, great. Patient leaves hospital, wonderful. See them at six weeks in the outpatients, no murmur, and they're looking well, job done. But of course it isn't. And the cardiologists are onto this. They're looking at the midterm outcomes now for mitral valve repair, and it's very, very important. Uh, and with that standard setting. Now, we won't get through all of that in detail, but I'll, I'll have a go. So, this term, clefts, indentations, and malformations, even the term cleft gets people excited. They say the cleft is, the, is you take a cleaver, you split someone's head open, that's what a cleft is. You only see them in the anterior leaf that the congenital surgeons tell you. They don't tell you where else they see them. It doesn't matter. Clefts, indentations, or whatever they are, they are actually malformations of the valve. Here's the two typical ones, and some years ago, I, the, the bottom slide I showed in, in San Francisco at a big meeting in front of about 600 cardiac surgeons, and I asked people what they saw, and uh, well, what do you see in the, in the main picture, what do you see? I'll help you, ruptured cord, yeah, what else do you see? Prolapse leaflet, what else do you see? And everybody stopped them, nobody talks about the press. And you, those of you who do this surgery, there's either deep clefts on either side of a posterior leaflet prolapse, or on one side, on the other side, there's abnormal papillary muscles. It's a congenital lesion. Now, let's just ask ourselves the question. We use the word degenerative mitral valve disease, don't we? Why does the valve degenerate? We say it, we don't think about it. Why does it degenerate? What's the nurse going on? And this is the classic picture you know from the Carponti book, where he talks about fibromastic deficiency through to a Barlow's valve. Now, isn't it interesting when the big emphasis is on the fibroelastic deficiency, the blue-looking valve, that's not the bit that ever prolapses, is it? So there's a problem there, isn't there, in understanding this and trying to define it. The bit that prolapses is the bit in the posterior leaflet. And if you go to the pathology laboratory and you actually look at normal hearts, normal mitral valves are quite translucent. It's the way they normally are. So what this means, I've no idea. I don't think it means anything in terms of, of what's going on. So what I want to say to you is that this idea of degeneration of the valve is our changes in the structure through abnormal forces on the valve that the valve is not designed to deal with. And that's how you get the stretching of leaflets, cords, and their rupture. So let's stop for a moment and think how this valve forms. It's a blooming complicated thing. It's probably one of the most complicated things the body does next to making a brain. If you think about how the leaflets start, there's these cushions outpashing from the atrioventricular um, canal. And then they grow forwards, as I've shown in the bottom blue diagram. Um, and then you have to separate the familiar muscles from the wall, and then divide the cords. This is an extremely complicated process. Is it surprising that the body gets it wrong quite often? Answer, no. We did a study recently looking at normal and abnormal bowels, and I'll tell you a bit more about what we saw then. So this process is complicated, and the body gets it wrong. I would contend that if we had a means of studying in detail every single one of your mitral valves here, number of cores, length of cores, papillary muscles, and so on, it would be as distinctive for each one of you as your retinal scan. So, <clears throat> what happens in clefts? Well, this is the sort of thing that happens. These outpouchings grow forwards, the cushions grow forwards. And where you get clefts, you've got lack of growth. And it is lack of growth, and I'll show you why in a minute. It's, it's nothing else other than that. And you have some that grow tall and some that grow short. And what is interesting, where the bit grows short on the posterior leaf, it grows longer on the anterior leaflets. You often see this moulding of the leaflets one to the other. Here is what's called the reference point by uh, Prof oh, sorry, go back, sorry. Uh, Professor Carpentier. <coughs> called the reference point because it never prolapses. Well, uh, it does. And here you've got a deep cleft on one side and you've got a commissure on the other. An isolated P1 prolapse, which is very easy to fix, uh, hence the reference point. And this is the absolute extreme example in the so-called Barlow's valve 
We look at the Barlow's valve, we look at the excess leaflet tissue, we like to call it, we look at the thickness, but we don't notice these deep clefts all over the place. <coughs> this is a highly abnormal congenital valve uh, that's developed like this. Now, there was a recent paper published by, by the Enrico Serrano group talking about the impact on clefts and outcome from mitral valve surgery. And they said their conclusions were, you should close these clefts. I think this is utterly wrong. You should not close the cleft. First of all, it depends on what you've done into repairing the valve, and it depends whether you're doing resectional surgery or cordal implantation. And I'm afraid there's a 40-minute lecture here, and I don't have time to go into it, but I will take questions. If you close one cleft, and many of you may have done this, what do you notice? The cleft on the other side starts to leak, doesn't it? So you go and put another stitch over there. Take the first stitch out, that side doesn't leak anymore. So be careful about closing clefts, and I'm going to say more about that in a second. So I think that conclusion is wrong. Um, we published this study uh, recently where we looked at a whole series of so-called normals, normal mitral valves, patients with aortic stenosis or something, coronary disease, and those with mitral valve prolapse. And what we found was that in patients with mitral valve prolapse, there were clefts in virtually every single one of these cases. And where there wasn't a deep cleft, then there were abnormal papillary muscles. Uh, and so we felt that the actual presence of the cleft was contributing to the altered resistance of the mitral valve to the forces acting on it. Forget about the mitral valve opening and just closing. Think about it as a force field. We like to think about the heart empty because that's how we see it. Imagine it's full and it's pressurised. The ventricle is developing up to 120, 160 millimetres of mercury. That load needs to be shared around the mitral valve. And it's a very clever structure. Now, those of you who have seen much rheumatic disease, as Steve and I did in the early part of our career, one of the first things we were told about rheumatic disease is you do not take the valvotomy to the annulus. Remember that? Because you've got to leave. You need to have this transmission of forces around the valve. So if you get isolated clefts, this is what you have. Now, why am I showing this? Um, picture of a pretty woman, well it's a good excuse but the real reason is the pleated skirt. Ladies wear pleated skirts, I'm told so they can move their legs freely, apart from the fashion statement. If you wear pencil skirts you're walking like this. If you wear pleated skirts you can walk normally. So the pleat allows the orifice of the skirt to open up and it's the same with the mitral valve. I mentioned to you about these cores, it's a drawing, it's just a drawing I did from many pictures I've seen if this is what you will always see. The cords extend right to the annulus in these clefts because it's never grown forwards. So the cords have just separated and formed to the point where, where they come from the annulus. So what are the effects of all of this? So normal cord, no, sorry, normal cleft is up to a third of the depth of the leaflet. What we see in isolated approach to leaflet prolapse is either on both sides or certainly on one side. Now the effect of that if you think of this distribution of force around the leaflet, as I've shown you here, in a normal valve it's just distributed evenly. If you've got these deep clefts, you have isolated areas which bear the same force per square millimetre surface area of the rest of the valve. And it's not designed to do that. And you will also know that the cords tend to come in from the side. Um, of, of the, on either side of these. You have this exposed area, and where you often have a prolapse in section, quite often there's no ruptured core to it. There often is, but there often isn't as well. So this force is isolated, causing a leaflet stretch and then rupture. And as I've also said, that in the papillary muscles, if you look in these patients with that, I'm supposed to leave the prolapse. The posterior inferior papillary muscle is often abnormal. It's often broken up into multiple heads. They're shortened, they're reduced in height, and they're often very close up under the valve. I'll bet most of you never look at the papillary muscles. Next valve you repair, take the time to look at the papillary muscles. You'll find this to be true. The, um, the um, uh, antero superior is usually more normal than the posterior inferior. And if you have abnormal spread of load through the cords from that point and a cord on the other side you have abnormally loaded valves and this is what we tend to see when we looked at this series of patients where we looked at normals and abnormals this breaking up of the papillary muscle heads and the extreme of course is in the Barlow's valve so this is the hypothesis you get un um, uh, unloaded uh, so loaded leaflet can't, can't share the load, the leaflet stretches the cord stretch and eventually the rupture now the other thing is a part of the story if you go to the pathologist and you say what's myxomatous de degeneration Mr. Pathologist, do you see it anywhere else? oh yes we see it all over the place where else do you see it? usually around joints in pe people with osteoarthritis myxomatous degeneration is disruption of collagen laying down a pyeline cartilage
and uh, mucous material. So you see it with this abnormal force. Now, it's interesting, a number of years ago, I probably wouldn't be able to do it now, I took some biopsies from the so-called normal parts of the fibroelastic diffusion valve, and they were normal. So you look at the part that's stretched, and um, the ruptured cord, and it's thickened, uh, and you can see it's focused around the, the po point of uh, carrying the force around the cords. So that's um, a little bit to say to you that this is a congenital lesion. The degeneration is through abnormal forces over part of a lifetime, producing the effects we can see. Clefts to close or not to close, this is really what I was just saying to you. If you close one, you often open another, and you produce regurgitation. So that's all I've got time to talk to you about in terms of clefts and so forth. Uh, saddles and lassoes. Um, the saddle is the saddle shape of the valve. The lasso are rings. There is more nonsense talked about annulopacity rings than almost anything else in mitral valve surgery. The first and most important principle of the mitral annulus is it is dynamic. We all pay lips of service to it. If you're in examination, you'll know the figures. It changes up to 40% of its orifice circumference throughout the cardiac cycle. And then we go and ignore it with how we treat it in mitral valve regurgitation. <coughs> it's, a, it's there for a reason. It's a sphincter. The base of the heart is a sphincter, and it contributes to sharing the load <coughs> by through cooptation of the leaflets. The, the, the saddle part comes from the fact that the septal portion of the anterior leaflet is part of the outflow tract of the left ventricle. The outflow tract of the left ventricle is cylindrical, and this valve forms part of it. You don't have to do anything to give the valve a saddle shape. Once the ventricle is tensioned and it contracts, it will form a saddle shape. You can stop it by putting a rigid ring in, and that will certainly stop that normal saddle conformation. Does it matter? Probably not, um, other than in a purest sense, that the load spread on the anterior leaflet, its ability to deal with the load, is built upon this force distribution upon the saddle-shaped leaflet. And there's lots of force field studies now to show this, uh, from Mayo Clinic, from uh, Craig Miller, and, and, and several others. So in a purest sense, it does matter. And if we're going to operate on younger and younger people earlier and earlier in their disease process, the more physiological we can keep the valve, the better. So the saddle shape will impose itself. So this is where I, <coughs> I come down very much on the side of using a band and not a ring, a C-band. But the C-band must go from trigone to trigone, not commissure to commissure. If it's half the circumference or less, then the valve, the, the ring can stretch again. If it's trigone to trigone, it won't. The only part of the mitral annulus that has fibrous tissue in it that you can call an annulus is the left fibrous trigone, which is part of the central fibrous body of the heart, and it extends for a, a centimeter or two down towards the P1, and the other uh, trigone on the other side. It's strong, it'll hold stitches, and it'll support your ring. So a C, C ring and a band, a flexible ring, gives you retention of flexibility, and it gives you the normal saddle shape of the valve. You don't have to worry about it beyond that. Why do we use rings? You've asked yourself the question. And the answer, because you were told to, isn't good enough. Well, we use rings to actually return a stretched orifice towards its normal surface area and annular diameter to give you proper captation. But that is telling you you're operating too late. You're operating on a patient whose ventricle is already stretched. If you have to do it, you have to do it. And if it has stretched, there's fibrous tissue in the muscle. We now know this. It's going to go on stretching, and it'll recur if you don't put a ring in. If you're operating very early and you've not got left ventricular change and you've got full coaptation with good coaptation of, of both leaflets up to a centimeter in height, I contend you don't need a ring. I've been doing this for a long time and I haven't regretted it. So it doesn't mean so you don't need a ring, period. If you're operating early, you don't need to actually make the annulus um, uh, fix and put a ring in. SAM, very quickly, how do we avoid SAM? Well, the commonest cause is a ring. An ill-chosen, ill-sized ring is a cause of a lot of problems. And there's now several papers appearing, you will know from cardiologists, talking about mitral stenosis after mitral valve repair. I hope you've seen the papers. There's about four or five of them in Jack and other ones. So you can't just use any old ring. And this whole idea of downsizing, which was first used by those working in ischemic mitrals and transferred to, to degenerative mitrals, is an absolute anathema. You mustn't do it. You size it to the surface area of the closed valve with good coaptation, which you test with, with, with the, the ink test. Second thing is that the, the most common thing is a too tall a mural leaflet. If the mural leaflet is 50% or greater of the, of the diameter of the valve, it will push the, the, uh, 
the um, anterior leaflet into the outflow tract when you put a ring in because you fix the annulus. And SAM, other than in hokum and in a few cases, is iatrogenic. If it wasn't there before you started and it's there after, you've caused it. We've caused it. So you have to think about what you're doing and how you handle it. And the mural aortic leaflet uh, ratio is reversed. <clears throat> now, one thing you must be very careful is the prominent knuckle on the outflow tract. This is not hokum. I've made the mistake once myself. I resected it. It opened up. We got a VSD, which is very difficult to close. Hokum's different. In hokum, there's fibrous tissue in that area, and it'll, it'll stand the resection. The standard ventricle won't. So these knuckles, don't touch them. Deal with it through the, the uh, mitral valve. So this is what you commonly see, and you deal with it by actually <coughs> reducing the height of the mural leaflet. You can over-shorten the neocords, and that's proposed by quite a few people, Pat McCarthy and others, who suggest that you can do this. It's perfectly reasonable. But then, of course, you turn the valve into a monoleaflet valve again. And I would contend that we're operating on young patients. We're trying to have a physiological valve. And sizing the annuloplasty ring, when you use it, size it on the surface area of the whole of the mitral annulus. Steve's on his feet. I'm going to have to stop. So was there anything else I quickly wanted to say? I'm not going to talk about calcification. Um, but I will just leave you, I can't find it now, sorry, with that for fun. Okay, thank you very much.